Welcome, everybody. We are back. Another interview here in the crypt. Very excited to be here, guys. I always tell you guys that doing my video format of interviewing is what I truly do love doing. Also love doing radio, though, guys. I can't lie. So I'm really doing both. And I think that uh, doing a video interview, though, is where I started and probably what I enjoy doing the most. But I am really looking forward to this one. And I just want to thank everybody who is uh talking in the comments uh, about the interviews I'm doing and giving me your thoughts on my guest and that. I appreciate you guys so much and uh, you'll, you, I can't thank you guys enough for all the support that I'm getting. It is an amazing uh, thing to, to witness when you have people kind of uh, interacting and giving their thoughts on what is being talked about. And some of these topics that we dive into are pretty heavy. They're pretty deep. But I think they're also topics that need to be discussed. So I am really excited to have my guest on uh, for this interview. I did have them on my radio show a few months back, actually. It was quite a, a few months back. It uh, went really amazing. A lot of the people that heard the Radio 1 uh, interview that we did, was I got great feedback from it to the point where they were asking when I would have her back on. So that's what we're doing this evening. And before I do bring my guest on, I just like to, I want to say this at the beginning because it seems that for some reason people don't watch the videos right to the end and miss a lot of what I say at the end. So I want to say that at the beginning, if you guys do enjoy radio format, please head over to revolution.radio. You can find me there three days a week on their Friday nights in the Hawk's Nest from 8 till about 11 p.m. Then there's also Saturday night. That is the Crypt Rick and Jonathan show with my amazing co-host, Jonathan Wright. And that is also in Studio B from 6 to 8 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. And then I'm in Monday evening in Studio A. Once again, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's the Crypt Rick I've Been Thinking show, my original show. So please, guys, if you do like radio and that style of uh, interview, please check it out there, guys. Just head over to the archive section on revolution.radio and you can find all of my past shows. There's a whack of them now. been doing it for over a year. So please, guys. Head over there, check it out. Lots of great content creators there as well, covering so many important topics. And I just think it's a great format. I really do enjoy the radio format. I grew up with it. So, I mean, there's a little place in my heart for it. And I think that uh, it's cool because there's no censorship there either, like there is on these bigger platforms. Freedom of speech is alive and well over there. We talk about anything we want. There's no code words. It's amazing. So thank you, guys. Don't want to babble on too much longer. I'm just going to go ahead and welcome my guest once again here, Stephanie Mo Davis. Welcome, Stephanie, to the show once again. Hi, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me back. Oh, I, it's a it's my pleasure. It really is. Uh, we had such a great talk when I I first met you during Mark's class, How to Become the True Media, and right. uh, I had to get you on the show because the things you were talking about after class, I just knew that I you were somebody I had to get on there because. You covered. You, we were just talking about so many of the things that that I cover, and mm. I think it's important. And so I will at the end make sure, Stephanie, that I let everyone. You can let everyone know where they can find your content because you're doing some great stuff, and I want people to definitely check it out. I'll leave links in the description so everybody can get to your content. Thank doing you, great Rick. Stuff. Yeah. So I'm excited here. We got. I, we kind of talked about some deep topics that we could get into and so i'm looking forward to that but for people that don't know you stephanie maybe if they've never seen your work or heard the interview that i did with you on the radio can you maybe let people know a little bit about your your journey and how you got to where you are now absolutely so uh well you know that my name is stephanie mo davis and uh i found mark pasio's work in this community probably about seven to eight years ago and I've been quietly watching from the background, and it's such a pleasure to get involved lately with some of the people that are on One Great Work Network. I want to say it's been such a breath of fresh air, the honesty, the vulnerability, the passion, um, you know, people taking action, the honesty, the truth. It's so beautiful for me. Um, my other job that I have right now, I'm working with a nonprofit, it's actually my nonprofit, and I have a, a co founder. It's called Awakening Healthcare. And as all of you know, there's um, layers upon layers of complications and, and difficult topics arising in that community. Mm -hmm. So it's um, sometimes draining. So to be a part of this community, it's, it's such a pleasure. Um, my journey um, started within my work, uh, really revolving around um, my, my illness experience, which also coalesced me 
uh, by default into the medical community. Prior to this experience that started when I was 20 years old, I was already a yoga teacher and I had a lot of experience in natural health, in doing inner work, in Eastern philosophy, in practicing yoga, mindfulness, meditation. I was really steeped in that since I've been about, I'd say, 16 years old. So I had this beautiful, loving, supportive experience with self-development and self-growth, and then I got catapulted through my illness into the medical community. And it was just a complete dichotomy uh, of what I had been used to as so far as more of a natural style of healing. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, my illness became very severe, very quick. So one thing that I like to always mention is that there are times that the medical, you know, healthcare is absolutely necessary. Right. Yeah. So it's important for me proceeding to develop an understanding that the medical side needs more of the holistic and the alternative and the natural and the nutrition and the inner work and the trauma work and all of these things that really profoundly changed my medical, my experience with medicine. And it's something that the people that I'm connected to within my particular illness group, which would be uh, kidney disease, autoimmune disease, and then I've had two organ transplants. So there's a, a huge community that I'm uh, in touch with and that I commune with who don't really, uh, aren't really told, don't really do the degree of investigation of all of these other means of getting through their illness besides, you know, using drugs. Right. And I, I want to say, you know, if you're going through something traumatic and you need something to help you through it, like by all means, I get that. But my issue and my passion is helping to bring this education of inner work inner self-development, inner healing, n or natural medicine, uh, as so far as just food and eating properly and exercising lifestyle, uh, you know, things that help our lifestyle as a means to coalesce with these people who are going through illness. So this really was my experience, this dual world of Eastern practices. I taught yoga for 20 years. I had three yoga studios. Wow. And the, the aggregate of the patient at my studios would come in and very often say the same thing. They would say, I've got a, an issue, you know, I'm getting a divorce, uh, you know, I have cancer or, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. I want to make a change. There was always some sort of catalyst as to why they came in the door. And then they would proceed by saying, I see a therapist, you know, I try to eat good, I do what the doctors tell me, uh, you know, and I still don't feel good. And at some point, I really started to do this scientific method on my own, from my own experience and with these clients. And I started to realize, well, I'll be damned. There's such an underlying thread of they enjoy my studio and classes because what we're doing is we're sharing the inner work together. Mm -hmm. We're talking about these very deep, soulful, spiritual, traumatic experiences and working on how to recapitulate the, the beliefs that kept us stuck. And it, it just cultivated into something so beautiful. And People would say to me, you know, wow, I feel like I've gotten more help from you than I have my, my therapist in five years. And again, not to poo-poo therapists, because for some people it works great and some therapists are excellent. And I see now more than ever therapists, certain therapists are trying to upgrade their level of wisdom and knowledge to get more connected with, with these terms like inner work. Um, so that really was the beginning of, you know, of my journey to get me where I am today. I have the yoga studios, really, really, really powerful transformations with my clients and with myself, just really being in this community based setting, talking about the stuff that a lot of us are afraid to talk about, doing the stretching, doing the very deep pranayama and breath work getting the exercise, getting the breathing, talking about nutrition, and then getting that very deep, meaningful, soulful connection with people that had like minds. And what I started to realize with the illness community that I was connected with, or the, the community under the umbrella of healthcare, was that they were missing all of that. And they weren't doing nearly as good. It was like this huge 50% of the puzzle that was missing. And that's when I decided that I didn't want to merely just help 
the collective in my yoga studios any longer that I wanted to somehow, and I know I've been called crazy for wanting to do this, <laughs> introduce these concepts that so profoundly took me from near-death experiences, organ transplants. I was such a sick, sick girl between the ages of 20 and 30. And I've completely transformed my illness experience. And, you know, not only is my, my health better, but the way that I got, had gotten through that long-term traumatic experience, I, I've been able to turn it around and make something really, really beautiful out of that pain, out of that hardship. And this is what I'm trying to introduce and show is not just available for somebody that looks like they have privilege. This transformation process and inner work is available for everybody. It doesn't cost much. You don't have to go anywhere special. It's something we can start in the comfort of our own home, especially if you do have an illness. So I'm trying and we're slowly starting to break through into the need for inner work within people in the chronic illness community or people that have, uh, you know, healthcare issues. So that that's kind of long, long rant, but no, that's, that's amazing. Kind of what I do. That's amazing. And I'm, and I'm, thank you for sharing that because I, I, I think it's important that people hear stories like yours and, and even mine to some degree, though I don't like to talk about it too much because I, I'm very, I don't ever want it to, to define who I am. So I, I mean, I will answer questions on it if people ask and I, but uh, I totally get what you're saying because I, when I was 16, I was get I started showing symptoms and getting chronic pain, and then it, that was followed by a year of doctors testing me. And I mean, I never had so much blood drawn out of me, and was at the hospital so much getting testing, and it took them a year to pin down what I had. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely at that age. I didn't know any better, and my yeah. mom and my dad didn't know any better either. It was kind of, we were raised doctor knows best and we kind of got thrown into the medical side of things. And I just trusted what doctors, I thought they knew best. I thought they knew what they were doing. And in a lot of cases I found out that they're, they really don't uh, have this uh, aspect of healing yourself and doing it without the medical, like going down the path of, of pills, I guess, and these all these big pharmaceutical drugs, which I was, uh, you know, on for a lot of years, that that's yep. kind of the route that they put me on, right? which led to a lot of things. I mean, I it, it just, it wasn't working. And so I'm glad that we're kind of going to be talking about the importance of doing the work on yourself, because once I started doing the work on myself and dealing with things yep. is when the change happened. I, at first, as I've told people in other episodes, um, I, when I first got diagnosed and I see, I, I blame this a lot, Stephanie, the, the way the doctors handled it too, because I had doctors telling me, you know, with your condition and that's what I call it guys, I'll either call it an inconvenience or a condition, but you know, for it's my disease. But from this point on, I'll probably call it my condition for just, I don't like the word disease. I think it's powerful. And so I, words have power. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got my condition, I, I, you know, the doctors were telling me that, you know, maybe by the time you're 25, you could be in a wheelchair. You, this is where you're going to have a tough life. You're, you're going to be very limited. And when you're 16 and 17 years old and hearing that, it's like your whole world implodes. Like, I mean, that's a, at that age, I think we're all really struggling. We don't know who we are and we're really trying to find ourselves. And so to get that kind of news. And I wasn't spiritually mature at that age by any stretch of the word. And so I really hearing doctors say that, I don't think even some doctors realize the power of what they're saying to people. You know, I think it would have been a totally different game, Stephanie, if they would have said to me, listen, you know, you got a tough road ahead of you, but it's doable. I mean, you and know, let's, and then I would have been so impressed if they would have said, let's kind of look at your diet. Look, let's look at all things and maybe we can address it. Maybe you do need medication. I'm not, and I'm like you, I'm not saying don't take medication. Don't go to a hospital. There's a need for these things. I agree, but they could have handled it better. And me not knowing any better and just trusting and really taking in what they said that I could be really like in a wheelchair. And that's devastating at a young age. Uh, and it yeah. became my identity for a lot of years. So yeah. I get what you're saying. Rick, thank you so much um, for sharing that. I mean, 16 is so young and I can completely relate. Same with me is even though I had this experience with Eastern medicine is, you know, when things got serious, my family was from the, that same mindset, 
you know, trust the doctor, the doctor knows best. And Mm -hmm. I went through the first many years of my experience and I I actually had a doctor say to me, and I I understand that there are really good doctors sprinkled out there, right? But we're we're talking about a movement, like I'm talking about a movement that we need to start to catch up with for a a cultural shift in, in healthcare. And that's, you know, how people talk to you, their words have power. Mm -hmm. You're very vulnerable when you, and you're, I, for me, I was scared. I was vulnerable. I didn't think I would have to face my own death when I was, you know, 20 years old. And it's the, the lack of understanding of how deeply connected the mind the body, the emotions, and your spiritual well-being all are, like there's just this complete lack of understanding. And if there is a way for them to have a better protocol to address a person as a holistic entity, right. we are holistic, you know, and I understand that their their job is to really keep us alive and mainly address the physical. Mm-hmm. And my part of awakening healthcare is to help share, just share. You know, I'm not I'm I'm not going to really move the needle on healthcare. I get it, but I just want to share in my experience when my mind, my body, my emotions and my spiritual be- well-being were all being addressed in this really deeply scary experience, I did a hundred times better. And I didn't require any antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication at one point. Like everything, I started to realize that I wasn't a victim to this identity of illness, that I still had a place within that experience. So this is a bit spiritual, but this is how I look at it. Rick, you and I talked about this yesterday, and I just, I loved this conversation, is that when you're hit with something really, a severe illness illness or whatever you want to call it, a disease, right? What happens is the fear, and you can even relate this to, you know, waking up in the matrix. It's, It's the same thing. When somebody is hit with a ton of fear, it's an identity, something about you feels threatened. And then it kind of, you lose vision. You start to lose vision of the whole when you have that fear. And what I see in a lot, especially now, because we do live in a culture that really mm, kind of perpetuates and idealizes victim mentality. And I see a lot in, in the culture of, you know, let's just say chronic kidney disease or whatever. It's it's so heavy and it's so complicated that what seems to make a lot of people feel better is to constantly, is to make the disease their identity. And what I see is it kind of makes them feel good if they're talking about it on YouTube or they're helping a nonprofit. Like there's this aspect of it, it does help, but then actually within them, it's like I can't get up and out of this identity because it, this actually isn't really feeding my soul and my true nature. Right. And they kind of get stuck. And it's like the the all the identity that they know is their illness identity. And then it's, oh, I'm a CKD warrior and I'm an advocate for this and I'm an advocate for my disease and here's me and my disease and I'm going to make an Instagram and just talk about all the nuances of my disease 24-7. And it's like all of a sudden you can see there's that something happens where it's like, it almost to me feels like a false empowerment where it's like I'm getting empowerment talking about this 24 seven, but actually there it's not really all of me and it's causing this, this stuckness or this I'm being drained energetically too. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying when we like certain people want to identify totally with their illness? Oh, absolutely. I did that for the first like five or six years when I got diagnosed, I absolutely became my disease. That was all I thought about. It's all I could talk about. It was my identity. I thought it was going to be my identity for the rest of my life. And I didn't address it the way it should have been addressed. I just, I didn't have the knowledge back then of, of myself for one thing. And what me not dealing with it, my way of dealing was it was, was, was I drank that that's, Mm -hmm. that was how I dealt with it. I, 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 and which is really not dealing with it. If I'm being honest, that's kind of, I just kind of you, I, that was my identity. I kind of 
thought that, okay, I'm, I don't really have much of a future. I can't, I mean, if I'm going to be in a wheelchair, I mean, it just, it was really because I was spiritually immature at that time mm-hmm. and immature in every way, actually, but at that age, but it was definitely, that's when I turned to drinking and I just, that, and then that became my identity because then I had my disease or my condition and then I drinking became my identity and I, I dove into a bottom of a bottle for almost seven years. Like mm. it, it was bad. It, it got bad. And it, it was, it was a dark, it, it, it started, it started, I think it's like any addiction. It starts out fun and then it get and then it becomes unfun very quickly. Rick, I'm so happy that you were able to really look at your condition same with me, really head on and not use these other proxies that that are unhealthy to try to deal with this reality that, you know, both you and I are going to have to face for the rest of our life, that there's something physical about, you know, this this existence we came into that's going to require some attention. But it's not my whole life. It's not my identity. It is an ex... I look at it as this makes me truly feel empowered this is an experience I'm having within my life. It's not my life. Mm-hmm. It's not my life. It's a part, something that I have to deal with, but it's not who I am. And I and I find that I thrive so much more the less I focus on it and think about it or try to run away from it. The more I focus on that spiritual well-being and just, just accepting, accepting this is part of my reality. I get it. I got to do some extra things or do whatever, some extra appointments, th- you know, for yeah. me to take care of myself. But it's not me. It's such a, it's such a small part of me. And this is so, so opposite of really what I see a lot of mainstream healthcare propagating. It's come get, you know, they want, they want your illness to be your identity in a way. It's like constantly talking about it, taking pills, come to the doctor every three months and just like, it's just, it's almost like, you know, they'll, they'll kind of squeeze you into that model if you don't break out. And as we're talking, it's so interesting because it is almost like, how do I live with a condition right? Mm-hmm. With, without getting sucked into the matrix that is healthcare and the way that modern healthcare treats disease. Absolutely. And with this very limited view and vision of all of these wonderful things that we can do for ourselves to really come up out of the physical and honor the physical, but yet be really connected to the, to the spiritual and to the whole experience of our life to really make the best out of our life and not have that condition be our identity or the reason why we're empowered or so disempowered. Yep, absolutely. And and what's kind of, uh, I was thinking of this before the interview that I I remember asking my, like, and this is, this was really interesting to me and I, and I don't, I haven't really thought of where it fits but I, I remember I have a few really good friends and I and I was talking to them and what was really cool, Stephanie, it was like I, I, I've known them for years and, and I said to them, I said, like, because I when I see when I look in the mirror, I, I really notice my disability, I, my disease. I, I do, it's it's part of me. I can't help it, and I'm really limited in some ways. Even when I do these interviews, I, I see it on camera. I'm like, wow, it's really noticeable. Other people don't. And what was shocking to me was after I get to know people, they don't see me with a dis with a disability. It's, it was really neat the way my friend and I've had many right. friends tell me this. They're like, "Yeah, you know, before we got to know you, we had a few questions, and you know, but now I don't I don't see your condition. I see you. I I know you. I don't I don't see it." And I was like, "Wow!" So really, the only person that's really focusing and seeing this condition is me, Rick. It was shocking. I don't know where it fits in, but it was really interesting. I, I I I love this. I love this so much because this is so this is such a powerful message, not just for us to share with your audience, but really to share with the world is that you're absolutely right. You told me about your condition when we first met and I told you about my condition. Mm-hmm. But when I see you the other day when I saw you on the round table that we did that I so thoroughly enjoyed, I didn't notice any of that. I just was like, hey, there's Rick. Yeah. But that's because you're also not it's not your identity. I could see, I just see you as Rick. Like there's Rick. Like there's nothing I'm physically seeing about you that I'm focused on because you're letting all of the other qualities around the condition 
arise so much more fully and bloom so much more fully that we don't see it. Yeah, isn't that? Yeah, it's so true. And I just, I just, want, I'm glad I, I, I thought of that during this interview because I wanted to bring it up. And I was like, I can't forget to bring this up to Stephanie because it was really a big. Mo- that was a big moment when my friends told me that, and it wasn't just like one friend said it. I asked a lot, of, a lot of my close friends and even family, and they're like, I don't know, we don't see it anymore. Like, it, you know, it's you're you. Like, and, and you're right, Steph. Like, you have to let your <sighs> your other qualities shine through that it's yeah. so important. And I, and I do know people that are dealing with some illnesses and they're, they're still at that stage where it's their identity. And I, and that could be anything, even, I mean, even depression. I mean, I, I'm not just talking even about physical, you know, a lot of people are dealing with depression and a lot of other things. And I think that be, it it's very easy when you have doctors kind of always wanting to be around you and there were and you're in that you're around that constantly and then even what's what was worse for me was people enabling me at, at an mm-hmm. early age I wish my I wish people would have gave me a kick in the ass so to speak and kind of got me out of that I, I was at a very low point when I first found out and I and they should have gave me a kick in the ass and said listen this is not your identity the things we're talking about now, but everybody kind of like, and it's a natural thing. I think they want to protect you and they want to comfort you. And, right. but how much damage are you kind of doing? I know there's a time and a place for that, but yeah. when do you know when to turn it off and say, okay, now we have to move forward. And I wish people would have done that sooner with me. Mm. If you know what I mean. I do Rick. And, you know, I think that both of us are blessed that we, when we did, we were able to say, Hey, wait, I'm going to write my own story with my condition. And because some people don't, don't do that, or like I'm seeing this now in my mind, Rick, what you're talking about with whether you're diagnosed with anything, right? It could just be, like you said, I don't want to say just be, but it doesn't have to be a physical, it could be depression, anxiety, whatever, high blood pressure, whatever it may be, that's maybe weighing on you. And again, if you're not focusing on the condition, you can sometimes get caught in what you did, which is the escape of the, how do I truly care myself and let my, my true essence come up, arise out of these things that perceivably weigh me down. And even, you know, it's the same thing with kind of waking up. It's the same thing. It's like, it's the identity. It's like, if you get stuck on an identity, no matter what it is, it is extraordinarily limiting to have all of this other essence of you shine through and and have you, you know, permit yourself to change and evolve and grow if we just pigeonhole ourselves into an illness identity, a career identity, yeah. uh, this identity. That's really what you and I are talking about. It's like how do we transcend the identity that we we have through the illness in an institution that wants to constantly like, you know, kind of keep us limited in that condition. And um, how do we transcend that? So what's awesome, I'm just realizing I'm going to toot our own horns here for just a (laughs) second. I usually don't do that. But not only were we able to kind of wake up out of the matrix, but we were we were able to wake up out of the conditioning from the, you know, the traditional healthcare model of keeping it more of a limitation and a fear around these you know, illness or condition than, than the true empowerment, which is to take care of ourselves as much as possible and not deny that it's there, but to make it just part of our experience and let the, the rest of us really, really shine through. Yep. I agree. And that you said a key thing there, Stephanie, that, that you have to be, you have to acknowledge it. And I, and that is, I think was like I was saying at the beginning, that was a key moment I remember is when I, I finally just had enough and I really did. I was like, I, I'm, and especially after I got over like the age of what they said I would be in a wheelchair, I was like, wait a minute, like, okay, I'm five years over this supposed deadline where I was not going to be able to do anything. And I started to realize that's when I started to realize, okay, there's something to this there. Yeah. there it's, I can't just rely on, on the out, outer. And I like, I'm always, I was always somebody looking for answers at first outwardly. And I yeah. think a lot of people do that, that they think that there's the answer they're looking for is somewhere out there. And I, and I realized at a key moment that the answers are inside. And I, and I realized that that was it. That's the change that had to happen first yeah. is I had to go in and, and, and that's what I hate about the new age religions. And I hear it all the time. I hear people talk about it. Don't address the dark things in your life. Don't, yeah. don't bring them forward because you're going to attract them. 
yeah. which is all BS. I mean, I, I always never bought into that. I'm like, you, how can you deal with something if you're not even acknowledging it's there? Yeah, right. Or so, yeah, or you're just spiritually bypassing. Yeah, and just, yeah. That's such a key point was you have to get to know yourself. And I think a lot of people don't truly know who they are. And I know that may sound funny to people listening because I'm sure they're going, I know who I am. But I mean, truly deep down through all the layers, who you truly are at your essence and at your true self that has, because I think we start that way. And then over years, everything gets kind of piled on and we, we form these beliefs, which I found fascinating. I didn't even know where half these beliefs at one time I had came from. Mm. They just kind of got stuck there in my, mm -hmm. you know, they just kind of got implanted somehow like a virus almost. Mm -hmm. And I think doing this work and a lot of people are using the term shadow work. Now I'm cool with that. I, mm -hmm. I used to call it confronting my demons. Mm hmm and taking that time to get you know yourself. And I, I really like to get your thoughts on that. I think that's key is that where it has to start is you have to start working on yourself, your inner I, self. That's where it, you need that foundation. I, yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, in terms of getting a physical diagnosis is that to me, the physical is the, you know, this is the this is the effect, right? Like this is the, this is, this is what we need to address in the physical, right? But it, it's stemming from all the other, you mm -hmm. know, spiritual places, right? Like the law of cause and effect, I'm trying to say. Yeah. So there is an essence of a need to take care of the physical if you have something going on. But at some point quickly, I realized that I started to address my condition with a diff, a complete, it seemed to be a complete opposite way than I was being kind of told. And what I realized is that most of the healthcare practitioners, um, I'm not necessarily saying to their defense, but kind of to their defense is they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. They have been completely brainwashed into this is what healthcare is. And this is the, this is everything about here's all the knowledge. And there's none of that shamanistic inner guide, transmutation, transformation, shadow work, mental work, and that realization of how profoundly our thoughts and our beliefs and our emotions are connected to these physical manifestations. Yeah. And there is such a profound connection. And, um, you know, so at one point I realized my illness, right? When I look at it head on, when I look at it head on, I don't avoid it. I don't bypass it. I don't self-medicate or medicate to, to shift out of really looking at it and confronting it right in the face. Mm -hmm. When I confront the reality of my illness, it it's a gift because I realize my time is limited. What I do, and I had to learn to face my own death. This Me is too. something that my illness really made, I, I had, I could not run or escape the pain and confusion and sadness and darkness of saying, wow, this could kill me, right? I had to look at it. And when you don't avoid it, which unfortunately I think some of the ways in which the current medical system treats is we medicate to create this mental stupor. And then we can't really, we don't have the mental capacity or strength to face it. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's very hard. But there are people that can help profoundly with people who want to face it head on. Because if you look at yourself and you realize how life is short and every day you get up, and like you said, Rick, every day, you know, I have to take some pills for my organ transplant. So my body doesn't reject it. That's, that's not really by choice, right? I don't want to lose it. I've already had two. Right. So I'm reminded every day of this, but I can look at it and it can limit me and I can be depressed and sad and go on medication and talk about this and be a victim of it. Or I can get up every day and realize that this is my life and this is what I deal with, and I'm going to make the absolute best out of it by focusing on everything else but that. Yeah. And it that inner work, that choice to really look at yourself, face death, get mature about life. Life is short. Shit happens to good people. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we have to just admit. And then once you face it, we stop running. We stop self, you know, drinking, self-medicating, being a victim to it. All of these things are all proxies and ways that we avoid really looking 
deeply, I think, within our own soul and accepting what we were given in this lifetime and trying to make the very best out of that. You can only get there when you just turn the vision completely back within yourself. You make peace with who you are, where you are. None of us know what's coming, right? People that don't have illness, I think very often they live life possibly thinking that they have an extended period of time to do whatever. They're not thinking about the 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 del- the fragility of life like we do and it it's like they still anybody could lose their life at any point but to me my my illness and my pain and my suffering around it has been my gift not my detriment it's been my gift to get me to wake up and mature up and to be my fullest self around this as soon as possible so for me again it's not You know, I don't say F my disease and F that, you know, I say, thank you. Thank you. Because you woke me up and I couldn't be more happy than the life I've been given with the way I show up within my soul and my spirit to be, you know, of service to, to humanity. So makes that that's so thank you. That that was so powerful what you're saying. And it's so true that you have to look inward and, and, and confront. And I, and I noticed when I started doing the shadow work on myself, that these things that in my mind were so much bigger than they really were. And and I, I mean, I, they become monsters when you kind of ignore them and you let them grow. I, I, and I would be like, wow, like, and then when I started really doing, and there was, there was definitely hard times. I mean, I went through a really dark period when I started looking inward to myself because I had to get brutally honest with myself and, and face some things. And, yeah. and, and it was like you said, you know, I realized, you know, okay, I have this condition. It's not going anywhere. It's, and it, it is going to get worse over time, but how I approach it and how yeah. I, uh, and how I address it and interact with it on my, in my personal level, interacting with my condition is very key to the results that I'm going to manifest. And That's right. It was so, that was such a powerful moment. And then I just want people to know that once you start, it's, it's work. It's called shadow work for a reason. It takes work and it's not a one and done. You don't do it on a weekend. I mean, I do try to do it every day. And mm-hmm. I would love to get your thoughts on this, Stephanie, because I, I think a lot of the distractions that are out there, and I'm glad you brought up even the medications, because that's a topic I've been starting to really look into, is that people are really getting medicated out there because it, for some reason it's become a bad thing to have emotions and then let me explain what i mean by that everybody wants it has it in their head that they should feel great 24 7 they should always be in a good mood yeah and that's what people think they should be and i'm like no we have these other emotions for a reason they're either a warning signal they're something that you're not addressing there's a reason for them and i really get worried when people if they experience a, a down day, I have days where a couple of days where I'm really down and I'm having a rough go of things, mm-hmm. but I'm not medicating myself for it. I, right. I mean, you have to feel it, address it and work through it. And then that's where it loses its power. And I just, I think that people too, doctors too quickly want to medicate people. And I'm not saying there's, and we said this at the beginning, Stephanie, that there is a time and a place for it. I'll always right. say that. Right. But I see a lot of people medicating for, and thinking that, you know, having, you know, down days or having emotions where you don't, you know, you're not a hundred percent that day. You don't need to jump on medication for that is what I'm trying to say. I think that we have to be very careful because these emotions are kind of our compass is what I look at. Exactly. The, the emotions are a guy to me, like a guidance system. And you're right. I absolutely do think that we jump on giving prescribing medication too soon. I'm not talking about for like extreme high blood pressure or something. Yeah, exactly. I'm right. talking about the, you know, the benzos and all, all this stuff. It, and again, there's, I think that there's a medical fear of letting someone be in their darkness. I, I think they, they don't, they don't have this skill set. Whereas like a shaman, right. They put, they're there with you through the darkness yep. and they, they can handle that. It's a completely different experience. And I think that there's so much fear in the modern medical system of, you know, whether it be just liability or, you know, something goes wrong if you don't, that it's like, we want to get them in a space where we feel like, you know, they're going to be okay, I'm going to be okay, and everything's going to be okay. And that's not how shadow and inner work works. It it's yeah. it's the opposite. It's like, 
getting radically uncomfortable and towing that line of, you know, I mean, when I was doing my shadow work and again, I still, it's something that I continuously, me too. <laughs> mon- I monitor myself. I don't really want to call it shadow work at this point, but I'm, I'm, I'm self-reflecting and just kind of pivoting and making sure that I'm not, you know, where I'm coming from and it's that like I'm not in trying on yourself. to project. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's, you know, this work requires one to be in states of experience that um, are not comfortable. And, you know, the, the modern medical system very often is how quickly can we make this person uncomfortable? And yes, at times, if your fingers cut off, and you got to sew something back, like, this is a little different. There's, there's nuance here that seems to be exceptionally complicated for healthcare to really sit with. And, and for some people, some patients to sit with too, it's, it's, but that's been the greatest reward is to sit in the discomfort. And, um, you know, like I said, it can look a little scary. Like you said, when I first started this work, this, this work was invited to me. It wasn't really a choice. It was something where I started to realize it and it was naturally emanating. There was a desire. There was a call within me. I didn't even really know what shadow work was when I started this. Right, it's just <laughs> there, there was this call and this, this um, discomfort. And like you, Rick, you know, at times I, I tried to run away from it. And I have to be very honest is that when you run from shadow work, it doesn't always look like negative or unhealthy means that we run to like drugs or alcohol or promiscuous se- like sex or like yep. it's for me how I, how I I actually came to this work was through an opposite was from a polar aspect now this is going to sound weird but hear me for a second I was a yoga teacher for close to 15 years and I, I was a great yoga teacher and I had multiple yoga centers and people would come to me and say we love it here you're an amazing teacher I can't wait for my yoga class oh it makes me feel so much better better. Oh, I can't wait to get out of work to come here because work sucks or I'm having problems with my partner. I just want to live here with you guys at the yoga studio. And at some reason, it took me a long time to, to become privy of this Rick because I was high on my own supply a little bit. And I was like, oh, I'm so great that they love it here. I'm so great that I can supply you with something that helps you to feel better. That's healthy, right? But at some point, I started to realize people were starting to say that they liked being at yoga and with those people more than their real life and the people that they were involved with in their real life. And they were using unconsciously in a healthy way yoga all the time as a means to escape from the job that they had to quit or the difficult conversation they had to have with their partner or some other things that they needed to face. So at some point I realized, wow, you can even use something positive as a means of like avoiding that next deeper step of what you really need to face within your life. So I needed to strip everything away, all of my comfort zones. And I literally sat with myself for several months on, I was in an apartment. I I just moved and I wouldn't even allow myself any furniture. It was super strange. I just had a blow up bed. I needed the space and I had to sit there with myself doing nothing. No yoga, no self-medicating, no going out with a friend for a glass of wine, nothing. I didn't allow myself anything that was going to get me out of the deepest aspects of what I needed to feel. And that started my process. I had to strip it all away. Now, again, there's a time and place, obviously, for these modalities that are really, really beneficial. But for me personally, I had to strip away anything I was doing that made me shift my mindset away from what I needed to see. And that it was very hard. It was very hard. But once I start that information was coming up through me, like, you know, when you sit with yourself, things reveal themselves to you and you say, Oh, I, screwed up there, or I need to apologize to that person. Or, oh, I'm not looking at this right. You, it reveals itself. And I wanted to just sit with myself and feel what was coming up and face the aspects of me that weren't 
good, that weren't seeing things properly, that were living based off of trauma responses, that were afraid, that were ashamed, that felt guilty, all the little things I did to try to avoid my full self, but yet project myself as, oh, look at Stephanie, the most wonderful yoga teacher, and she's so great and ever, no, I'm not so great. I'm human just like everybody else. And I have some messed up stuff that I've done and the ways that I've tried to escape and run from my whole self. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, I, I had to, you know, I actually took a, I stopped teaching. And that's when I said, I want to really try to help share these sorts of things that are so important in the world of healthcare and healing for patients, because this is what we need to do. And I realized that it's not just for patients, this is what the doctors need to do too. This Absolutely. is what the providers need to do. They have never sat with themselves. I mean, I don't want to say ever, I don't know all of them, but this profound inner transformation and transmutation and inner work and shadow work and biases, that that going within, you know, it's all in the, in the medical field very often about what can we do to fix you? This is not what I'm talking about. This is how can we encourage the patients to go within to help work upon themselves and in fact, doctor, how can you make sure that you're not projecting your inner fears and wounds onto your patients? That's true. It needs, we all need this aspect of looking within. And I'm hoping, you know, that having these conversations, these small little pathetic steps that you and I are having here and, you know, the one great network is, we're, there are many people who are talking about this. And I think that none of us is really going to get away with being able to bypass this anymore because for some reason in this time in history, it seems like all is being revealed yep. whether you want it or not. And that doesn't mean just about the government or about, you know, your neighbor. It means about you, the inner workings of you. It's being revealed. Everything is calling for transparency. And if we're going to fix anything out in the world, it needs to be coupled with this commitment to our own inner work too. Absolutely. I couldn't have said that better, Stephanie, a hundred percent that as I was saying, that's the foundation that people I think are lacking. And I think people would rather do anything than to just sit quiet with themselves. And I've challenged people with this to sit with themselves even for, a, you know, and it, it sounds easy, even 15 minutes, no distractions in a room, anywhere you want to do it, but sit quiet by yourself. And a lot of people say, I do that all the time. I'm by myself. I'm watching TV. And I'm like, no, I'm not talking about sitting, listening to music or watching TV or have your phone in your hand. I mean, quiet, still, and with just yourself. And you can, and you have to, like you said, you're with your thoughts and you, they will reveal themselves. And the people I think run a million miles the other way, because it's like you said, there's a lot of things in their life, whether it's uh, I call them little traumas or big traumas because we all have traumas in our life that we are either dealing with or we're not and we're burying them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. parts of our life are, are of our, who we are at the time that we don't like. And I think people get really uncomfortable and scared when they have to confront that. But that is truly the way out of where people, where people are. And I see the distractions are out there. I see it with every, all around me. You have what's going on. And so like social media is a huge one. I think, mm -hmm. I think, um, all the pr TV programs out there, all, there's so many distractions, pick your poison to stop people from doing this work that, that this quiet time. I mean, how much, I, when I think about it, how much quiet time do people have mm -hmm. where they just with themselves and no distractions? I think, I'm safely, I would say very, very little in most cases. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Rick, I think one of the simplest things, I mean, you know, I, I think that a lot of us do have elements of privilege and we don't go through the degree of suffering, um, that it maybe takes to radically, have you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I found that, that I did naturally, I didn't do this based off of a, like a, I wasn't thinking when I did this, but as I explained to you, what I did naturally was I, I realized that I had to take away, pause my creature comforts. I had to stop doing those things, um, that were, I, I was like, um, let me think of how I want to say this. Any little thing that I was using 
outside of just sitting with myself, I had to put a pause on those things, all those creature comforts Mm -hmm. to make myself more uncomfortable to just be able to see the truth of who I was. I can't see the truth of who I am when I'm distracted or I'm doing other things. Again, those things, the the necessary things, the externalized things, the the practices and the methods and the, the outer world ways in which we mitigate and try to evolve and grow, certain of those practices came back into my life in balance. But for me to truly do the inner work, to really be able to see myself clearly, I had to take away anything that was really providing me comfort and to, to sit in a state of suffering, to sit there and to not try to run or mitigate or distract or put my attention elsewhere. I had to sit there with nothing to help me. And I remember being on that blow up bed. I I had a conversation with, with God, you know, whatever the God of your own understanding. And I, I said, it's, like it's just you and me. It's just yeah. it's just me here in this moment. And I'm here to listen. I'm here to help you, you know, please reveal to me the bullshit that I need to see about myself. Please. I'm not running. I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere or doing anything outside to mitigate this pain and discomfort until you reveal what I need to see. So it, the, I mean, again, it doesn't have to be some grand program or this or that, or just take away some of your creature comforts and the way that you do things to distract from the discomfort. Say like, like, you know, I need a drink tonight or I need this. Like, no, sit there and feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. Cause the only way we can heal it is if we truly remove all the layers to feel it as until it until it breaks our heart open and you have you can't touch that level of feeling if you're distracting in any way it's like i I keep realizing that there's so many built-up layers that we all have to really feeling to the degree that it cracks us open and that's really what we need and you know obviously some people get suffering and it does It, it you know you get into an accident or something happens and it like radically wakes them up Right. But here's the thing. We all don't want to be going through serious health issues or accidents to wake up from something. I think we're being called right now for all of us to do our own ritualized discomfort by eliminating, you know, the TV, the movies, the this, the that, the going out, the, the alcohol, whatever it may be. Just stop it. Just stop it all for an extended period of time and sit alone by yourself and really let it reveal, let the pain come up, let it come up and let it move through you. In yoga, I always used to say emotions are your guidance system, but they're also energy and action, meaning that these feelings arise of depression or anxiety or frustration or guilt or shame or whatever, they come up. But as soon as you let it come up, the energy shifts. And then you realize that only if you're continuing to choose that emotion, does it still exist in its negative state? It's like you realize actually that you have so much more control over your emotions than you, than you realize, but you have to get to that point to strip all your layers away and let it, let the full feeling come up, sit with the depression, sit with the anxiety, sit with the guilt, sit with the shame, sit with the resentment, be there like a, like a a mature divine mother would be for their parent and hold yourself in that space, letting it come up, letting it come up. And at some point you'll realize that if you let it come up, it moves and things drastically shift. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you transform that negativity. It it when you confront it, at least for me, it, it transformed into a positive energy. It's hard to explain when yeah. I started to confront it, and that's when I really realized the power of what even you're saying, Stephanie, is that you have to you have to feel it. I mean, and I think that that's what a lot of people are lacking now is care, is what I see. They just they don't care about themselves truly. And I mean, a lot of people may get upset when you say that. Like I say, a lot of people I believe don't even truly like themselves. 
and they don't care about themselves at a very deep level. And and I and I know at one time I was like that. I didn't truly love myself at one point. I didn't care. I didn't respect myself, but, but just by what I was doing to myself. And and I had to get that brutally honest. Like you said, you have to strip away your comforts, and you. But you also have to be willing to to do the journey and do the work. And um, like you said, it doesn't. Some people, it's a, it's a like a chronic illness, like you and I have, or maybe they get into an accident with drug addicts and other people. You hear they hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. But I, I I I like what you're saying. Like let's try to do. Let's try to get the results that we're talking about without having to go and hit rock bottom or hit yeah. uh, have a serious trauma. Yeah. And that's what we're kind of talking about. And I, the work I do on myself, I try to do it every day. And I kind of like, like you said, I check in on myself. It's not so much that I have to sit now for hours a day and really I've done that work. Right. I, so now it's more checking in. And I was telling you uh, when we were speaking yesterday that after every conversation that I have with anyone, no matter how long or how short, even after this one, I will sit and think about it in mm. detail and what was said and why it was said. And I just kind of over, I analyze all my interactions with people, which I think a lot of people don't even take the time to do that. And I found great uh, reward in doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really powerful thing when you really like look back at stuff and reflect on it, I guess is a great word. Yeah. It's so easy to, again, not realize the, the beauty in the present moment right. and to, and again, I, for me, I'm getting information every day within my experience right. and I'm really appreciating the interactions I have, whether it's with the person at the grocery store or whomever, I, I everybody to me, I see, um, as a gift and I, I look at them all equal and I realize that every interaction that I have within this existence has some degree of importance in, in it. Absolutely. And I don't just neglect it or avoid it or just think about the negative of the interaction. I'm always trying to distill and transmute. What did I learn from that? How can I grow from that? How can I become a better person by that? Like, look at that simplicity of that person. I'm always trying to formulate my experience in a way where I can see the negative or I can see the positive or I can see what I need to see within that experience. And like you said, Rick, there's so many ways of just externalizing and faking like you're a good person or you have it all yeah. together or your your identity. It's really about the addiction to identity. You can't do shadow work if you're not willing to change. Those two don't, work. They don't yeah. go together. <laughs> if you're not together. willing to break your identity, you are so attached to who you think you are in your story. Don't do shadow work. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work, or you're gonna get your ass kicked, really, yep. because you have. It, it's the time in your life where you want to strip away the falsities and strip away the ways in which we show ourselves in the world to be this, you know, perfect little person or whatever. No, it, it none of that exists anymore. And when you sit with somebody who's also committed to doing the work or has done the work, it's different. There's no pretentiousness. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to act a certain way. It's just real. It's just authentic. And that is something that is so desperately lacking from society and culture today is like, put away all this shit, the yeah. whatever, the makeup, the, the this, the that, the look, the all the fanciness about, you know, there's... We have access to everything now, pretty much, Rick. Mm -hmm. You know, we can make ourselves look a certain way through the metaverse, through AI. You can change. You can make yourself look however you want. But if you can't sit with yourself completely naked, and I mean naked, like bearing your soul and saying, look, you know, I've done some difficult, I've done some bad things, I've done some good things, and I, I, I there's a lot I don't know, and I'm trying, and I'm growing, and I'm evolving. If you can't be that person, then then you're 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 fabricating a false identity, trying Absolutely. to pr project yourself as having it all together, because none of us have it all together. That's so true. And like and I, I always say, like the ego. You, have, if you're gonna do the work on yourself, you have to check your ego at the door. You really do. And I think a lot of people, which is gonna be a great topic for another round table. I'm looking forward to is we're gonna be talking about ego, mm -hmm. because that I think a lot of people get stuck in in ego for sure. And mm -hmm. and, and and as you were saying, in this identity of who they are, or they want to portray who they are, and. 
yeah. think we're all guilty of that to some degree. I mean, it, it's it's complicated, and and I don't I don't think either of us are trying to say this these are easy answers oh. and that it's going to be simple. I, there's so many layers to this as you start peeling it back, and it, and that's why it becomes I call it work because you're working on this at all right. Uh, over time and yeah so you have i think a lot of people have and the and a, a great topic i like to ask you about because ego i think is also a good thing mm-hmm. because ego also is so, is what's going to drive you to become better at whatever it is you're doing it's going to give you your confidence mm-hmm. i think the problem stephanie is when the ego be it becomes you who i don't know how to word it um when you your ego is your identity i uh, your identity like that you li- how do I word it? I mean, maybe you can help me. I, like when you are you live are your, you trying I, to say when your when your ego kind of takes over and right. drives the sit, ship, and then you can no longer see right because your ego is then running the show. Exactly, that's perfect. Well, like you said, there you know, there's an important. I've had these conversations before with some really great people about you know it. The issue is, I feel that doing the work upon yourself helps you to truly get to know yourself right. and your your history and where your limitations and traumas or wounds lie. Because here's the reality, if you're going to talk about ego, is that some people have an overabundance of ego as a protection mechanism yep. and they can become, you know, very narcissistic or self-centered and their ego's running the show because they have some sort of deep fear from their childhood and they need to learn how to work with their ego or to, or to, to kind of put their ego in its right healthy place. But then there's other people who have grown up and they're, they're afraid to be egotistical. They're so super humble that they're, terrified to put themselves out in the world. They're kind of embarrassed. They don't want to be the center of attention. So these people need to work on creating a healthier relationship with their ego in a different direction. So there's so much nuance, but the problem is you got to first figure out who you are. I, when I say that to you, I know myself, I know myself because of the shadow work I've done upon myself Mm -hmm. and my tendency is to keep myself very small. And I'm afraid to put myself out in the world and be, be on stage. So my goal is to somehow have a little bit more of my ego help me to, to be confident, to put myself out there. So again, you, you have to do the work upon yourself, I think, to actually know how to most appropriately take the steps within your life to help you fulfill this potential. If if you don't know that about yourself and then somebody says to you, you got to kill your ego and it's all bad and it's trying to keep, well, then you're getting the wrong message for who you are. Yeah, very true. You, you said it perfect because I, I was trying to find the, the right wording. You said it perfect because that's a, I think it's a big topic. I really do. Ego is something I think that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, not in depth. I mean, it comes up like kind of like in conversation and that, and I kind of touch on it. It's a difficult one because as you were just saying, you, you have to do the work and kind of, like you said, some people, what is your relationship with your, yeah. Yeah. Like what you, everybody's different. Like some people, like you said, have too much ego. Some people, that's all it is, is this big chest thumping ego. It's larger than life. And then you have other people that they, they have no ego. Like it's so suppressed. It's so diminished. Yeah. And yeah. You know, yep. Rick, I, I learned a lot and I, I want to, you know, maybe in the future, I want to, I might want to pr- repropose this is one thing that I did do in yoga, my yoga teaching that was very, very enlightening for people is we went very deep into the Eastern tradition of the energy systems, the energy centers of the body. So in Eastern practices, this is called the chakra system. And mm-hmm. I, I don't want to get too woo and new age, I but I will woo. say that, <laughs> that this mapping of what they've done with the body through the energy centers of the body is super educational, but what it also gives you is it tells you what does it look like when a particular energy center is underdeveloped and how does that rep, how does that present in the world when that particular center is overdeveloped? Mm-hmm. And what does it look like within the world in your experience if that energy center is underdeveloped based out, out of trauma? This is a nuance that I think societally we need to be able to start to understand is that we can't just say oh the ego's bad right. you have to know who you're t- do you have an underactive ego or an overactive ego and what does it what does that look like in the world and how do we work on trying to find a healthy balance so there there's always kind of these two sides of the coin with things so you're right you know ego most people assume it's bad 
right? Or, oh, he's an, he's an egotistical whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, where is that coming from? And what about the other people who don't have any ego, who are totally afraid to, to be in their ego and, and hide and are, are ashamed? So we need to start to, I, I think, having a conversation around ego is really important because some people will say it's bad. Some people say it's not bad. It's your wounds and it's a protection me mechanism to keep you safe. You know, and other people will say, well, it's kind of more about, you know, your traumas and how you grew up and it's kind of, so I think just even getting very clear, can we even agree on what ego is? Like if we're going to talk about addressing the ego, we have to come up with some sort of definition that we can all very feel like true. we can relate with. Yep. Very true. That, that, that would make a great conversation and identify what, yeah, because we need to know what we're even, like the parameters of what we're talking about. What it's does so ego important. mean to you? Yeah. Like what is your ego? Yeah. And I, I think you summed it up great. Like, like that is a great way to look at it. And it, it's important. It's an important topic. I will definitely dive into it one day because I, I really yeah. like looking at things like that. And I just, um, from what I see around the world, people are just in, they really need to start doing this work on themselves. And because I see people in a very reactive state, which I do know comes, it, when you boil it down, it's this fear base that we're, that a lot of people are in and they're so quick to react. And I, and I'm guilty of that at times too. I'm not by any means better than anyone else. There's moments where I, I catch myself reacting, but the, I was saying this to you off air I'm when I do that, I'm at least I'm very aware of it. When it happens, I catch it right away and I'm like, wow, like I really reacted in yeah. a quick way there. And why did and then I ask myself the question, why am I reacting this way? Like why am I offended? Why why did this bother me? Why did I get so upset? Why did I get mad? Yeah. Because there's a reason. Yep. You know, Rick, a lot of uh, this has been coming up the last like two days for me, which is um, kind of interesting because it's again, this is be. the work, I, <laughs> the work I used to be doing when I was teaching yoga, but I feel like we even psychically are connected to nature and nature is always fluctuating and seeking balance amongst yep. itself. And I think that as so far as this ability to respond or react, um, yes, you know, it'd be it'd be great if we were all mature enough to just always respond perfectly in every situation. Mm -hmm. But what I'm I'm kind of learning is that overreactions sometimes are necessary when the opposing party is in a severe underreaction. Okay, it makes sense. Yep. So it, it almost feels like, you know, if somebody, you know, if whatever, somebody in the government is ignoring that they're abusing, you know, enslaving people. Well, then of course you're going to have this confrontation because you're not, you're, you're in such an imbalance to see the situation in a, in an accurate way that the opposing force, it's like energy seeking balance is going to come at you a little more aggressively because you're so radically far off yeah. from the accuracy of the subject. So I, 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 I just want to kind of put that out there that sometimes you know, responding is always best, but I do feel that reactions happen when whatever the two parties are discussing, if there's a radical imbalance in mm -hmm. one end, the, you know, the physics would be like, okay, well then an equal and a, like an equal, but opposite reaction is going to come at you that, that tries to balance out wherever that conversation needs to be. So it's, you know, that's how I kind of perceive things is yes, I always try to think and respond and not be in a state of anger or frustration. But sometimes being in that state of a reaction is maybe the most direct way to get to the point with, with the other person, you know, but, yeah. um, it's, it's tricky and everybody, every circumstances is, is different with people. So that's another thing. It's like with one person, you might be able to respond and have great communication and another person, it's always reactionary, yeah. you know, and then you have to start asking those questions. Like, why can't we have a conversation that's not reactionary? Are you not healthy for me? Is this not healthy? And one thing that we've propagated in the past a lot, which I think is being challenged right now, especially in regards to relationships and friendships, is that in the past, I think that we kind of proselytized that relationships are hard. Mm -hmm. And that you got to overcome so many things and it's going to be hard and there's going to be a lot of frustration and yelling and, and, and to a degree, I, I, I agree, but I think that what we're realizing now is some of us have stayed in certain things based off of this philosophy of it's hard, but actually they're just not really a good equally yoked or aligned partner for us or friend for us. And Agreed. maybe 
maybe actually we have to rethink that relationship or friendship because, you know, I, I hear this a lot, you know, or people that are married a long time. It's like, Oh, it's all, it's so hard. It's so hard, but marriage is hard. And it's like, wait a minute, maybe you're actually just not aligned together. And you have to really, if, if you do this work upon yourself, these things become clear. And sure. that's what I think is important because I think the world is in a state of confusion and we're expressing this confusion without in the world, without into the world, we can all see that there's a lot of confusion out in the field, out in the world, a lot of anger, a lot of polarization. But if these people have done, ha, would start to do the work upon themselves, things become a lot more clear and articulated and, um, you can see, oh, actually, this is not healthy for me, or oh, actually, I need to get another job, or oh, actually, I need to have this conversation. So doing this inner work upon yourself literally changes not just your life, like your personal life, but all your relationships yeah. and the things that you're choosing in your external reality change too, because you now can become aligned with yourself. And now you realize that you can call yourself out on your own BS when you're aligning um, with things that aren't really good for you. You can see it. And I think the problem is nowadays a lot of people don't have that vision because they haven't done the work upon themselves to even see themselves. Agreed. Agreed. And and I'm glad we're talking about like – toxic people in a way because I think a lot of people if they haven't done the work on themselves I think you kind of attract people around you that are kind of in the same mindset if that makes any sense like I I, I think back to my drinking days I attracted these type of people like I yeah. it, they just came to me like and and and, and mm. it was really my mindset had a lot to do with the people that were around me whether I was attracting them or, and then you're so right there. Sometimes you just have to realize that there is toxic people that are a part of your life that you may have to cut loose because, and I hate using the analogy, Stephanie, that you hear everybody use it, but if somebody's drowning, if you're not careful, they're going to drag you down with them. Right. So, right. you know, how often do you, like, how long do you reach out and try to help or help, you know, in, in that sense without being dragged down? But because, you know, sometimes you have good friends, but they're, they're just not, good people in your life at that moment they're 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 bringing you down and that's a rough thing to come to terms with but it's true that, yeah and that's right. goes for friendships marriages dating i mean it, it it covers a broad spectrum but then right there it is rick if you're if you have given over your sovereignty to your identity mm -hmm. It's it you you become paralyzed to really make those shifts within your life because you're so invested. You have this whole story around your identity, yeah. you know. And again, that that's what we've done. That's what culturally, you know, this is kind of how we've lived. And I think that we're this is an invitation for us to instead of getting into situations that we eventually end up needing therapy to stay in, for mm -hmm. instance, like a marriage, right? Do it different and align with yourself first so you can align with the proper people and cultivate something healthy that doesn't need to be fixed so much down the road or that you can consciously just shift out of if, if, it, if it needs to be. But it seems like we get ourselves in these situations and then we just find ourselves um, – creating, you know, trying to cultivate a solution for this problem and then another solution for the following problem mm -hmm. and another external solution for this problem and then another solution for this problem. We see this in healthcare. It's like, well, how do we keep coming up with all of these different things outside of us to fix all of these diseases? Not once have we talked about inner work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that it keeps coming back to that, doesn't it? That this inner work that you have to do on yourself. And I think if people just, you know, that's why I think people, you know, they, they are either have you know, if there are multiple marriages and I think of people that are always dating and going from partner to partner to partner, they're looking once again, like I said earlier, for that external solution. Yeah. And, and um, until they do the work on themselves, it's going to be very tough. But like you, we were talking, I think this came up in the round table, which is interesting that and I think it was you that brought up that once in a while, two people that are really messed up kind of, they kind of sync and it, it works. Like it, they're both in, the, it's kind of like this locking key I find. And then you get two yeah. people that are kind of feeding the trauma off of each other. This then may come this circle of feeding each other, if you know what I mean. And it, so that does happen too, where, it's a comfort zone. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a negative downward spiral comfort zone. And, um, 
because of the identity or the belief systems or, you know, I know people who are, you know, very religious and they, they're in an awful marriage, but it's, they're like, well, I'm not going to get a divorce because then I'm going to go to hell. I mean, these are the things that I believe when you're, when you're abandoning your soul in, in to that degree, it, it affects the collective. It, it affects your external reality. Oh, yeah, and this yeah. is what I'm saying. I can't really see how we can try to fix all of our problems externally, you know, until we all choose to do the work upon ourselves simultaneously. I just don't think, I think we live in a time where we're not going to get an external solution. You know, I don't believe God is going to, you know, Jesus is going to come down and save us. Like we have to do this work here. We can't escape it. And if you are connected to your identity and you're, you're, you have all of this facades and little lies and little, it's like, it's like you're living in somebody else's life, calling it your own. And shadow work and this inner work will completely deconstruct everything about us that's not true. Yeah, it, and that it means that you're going to change, and your life is going to change, and you got to be ready for that. But what's the alternative when you start to wake up and you turn away from yourself? It's not going to be a happy existence. That's so true. And and you have to, to when you start doing the shadow work. That's a great point that you bring up. That you have to be willing to tear down a lot of your belief systems and really strip yourself down. That's what I had to do. And yeah. it was key to doing that. And if I wouldn't have been willing to do that, it would have never worked. You have to be willing to really start from the ground up of your, of who you are and start building it up and doing it in truth is what I would say because of these little lies that we do tell each other and these little justifications we do for our actions. And I think it becomes this, it just becomes you know, a, a routine that people do is constantly justifying or lying to themselves and you and it's so important like you said you have to be willing to really let go of everything and and yeah, to find your true yeah. self that's key there's a quote i'm trying to pull I love up when you pull up quotes these are awesome yeah i have it on the bottom of my email if anybody ever emails me <laughs> um love is a flame that burns everything other than itself it is the destruction of all that is false and the fulfillment of all that is true. And to me, that's what inner work was for me. It was the fire. It was the flame that layer by layer burned everything about my story that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just left me with me, me, I, I, it, me. You know, there, there, I, I can just sit here with anybody at any time, you know, whether I'm dressed up or not dressed up on camera or this or that or whatever. I don't care. I don't care because I know the most important side, a part of me stems from within Absolutely. and I'm comfortable being that person. And when we live in a world where people are comfortable being authentic and being vulnerable and being honest, that's, I think, when we start to see change. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've been saying that for so long now that, because we're talking about people that look for external answers to, to kind of hear heal what's going on inside. And I've been saying like, this is definitely a spiritual war that we're in. It's yeah. not, you know, we're not going to vote this away. We're not going to find an external source. It all starts within. I think that's, uh, we're really, I want to hammer that home and I keep will doing that as long as I can. And even during this interview, I think this is, it's so important to keep hammering that home that this is a spiritual war. It's a war with ourselves in a way to, to really get to know who we are. And I'm kind of like you, cause I know people that are very religious and they're like, you know, Jesus is coming down one day and he's going to fix everything. And I have other people that say that UFOs are going to come and, and yeah. fix the world one day. And I'm like, yeah. To me, that just leads into no action on your own. It's you're waiting, and I'm just like, this is such a. Then once again, it's like you were saying, we become stagnant. We be kind of just sitting there going, I don't have to do anything. It's going to get all fixed in the end. Right. Very dangerous. I think that's right. such a dangerous place to to be when you think about it. Oh, well, and your thought. yeah, and it's never been easier to try to rely on some sort of external means to help you or come save or get it. You know, and then. I understand, you know, you can get involved in these groups and, you know, wh whether it be from Jesus to, to ufology yeah. and, and you're so distracted by that. It's like, just stop. Like I can just encourage everybody, just stop, yeah. stop over seeking and running away and really look at yourself and ask yourself, are you really happy? And I mean, that's a good place to start. Yeah, true. How do I feel? Let me ask my, yeah. yeah. How do I feel? Let me really ask myself, how do I feel? How do I feel in my career? How do I feel in myself? How do I feel in my body? 
How do I feel with my partner? How do I feel? Get it at, like, get radically honest. And if you don't feel good about something, don't run away from that. Go into it and start to clean up your life from the inside out. Yeah, that's such great advice. And, and I don't want to keep you too, too much longer. But I guess, like I said, Stephanie, I could talk to you for hours. I, I really enjoy our conversations because I think we cover Me so too. much important things. And I hope it gets people really thinking. Um, to kind of bring it full circle, we were talking a lot about the inner work, uh, working on our, on our, uh, who we are inside and, and dealing with our traumas and stuff like that. Another thing that to, to kind of bring it right around the circle here is that's, uh, that was so important, but also what was very important for me was also taking care of myself, um, in a physical sense of, mm -hmm. as in, uh, what I'm eating and what, you know, getting rid of all of these medications. There was a lot of things that, that I, that also went along with doing the shadow work was changing. My diet was a big one. That was yeah. huge because I look at what they call food. Now, when you start looking at it is it's crazy because at least we're in my grocery stores, we have like maybe one or two aisles of healthy food. And then we've got 30 aisles of all this processed packaged yeah. stuff. That's not even food. And I really started to even notice that went right along with my shadow work was changing and starting to eat a more healthy diet. I would love to hear yeah. your thoughts on that because like you said, you taught yoga. So you understand yeah. the importance of this is a, a multifaceted thing. You have to get right with yourself and, and then your diet. It's all important. It all comes together. To... Yeah. I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, if I'm going to refer back to the, the chakra mapping of the body Perfect. is if we can't commit to caring for our physical body, how can we perceive to start to take care of some of the more complex things such as our emotional body or spiritual body, our mental body? Mm -hmm. These are complex things that we have to go into. And if we don't have the fuel, if we don't feel good, if we are, you know, really overweight or have like a lot, a lot of other things that we're not, we're eating crappy and we're eating tons of sugar, you need energy to do inner work. Mm -hmm. You need energy. You need to be doing the best that you can to care for your physical body. That should be number one. If, you know, I would actually, you know, it, doing inner work, I think would, would be extra difficult for somebody who wasn't taking care of themselves because things happen with your physical body when you start doing inner work. Things start to shift and change. So you need to have at least a a, a foundation of trying to care and and take care of yourself consistently that should be number 1 actually yeah. should be how you know are you getting a little exercise are you eating well are you dumping the sugar like are you doing that that has to come first because doing this work is energetic and it's physical it takes a lot of work to do inner work so i totally agree with you you have to find the diet and experiment what works for you. And if you've been one way your whole life, you may need to go on a journey of exploring a little bit different ways of eating mm -hmm. until you find what works for you. Again, I'm not a one size fits all mentality with diet because from my experience, there's been times I I've spent long periods being vegetarian. And then there have been times where I, I've spent, you know, having to go back to eating some more, some meat and some. So again, I, I think you have to find what works best for your constitution. I would suggest one thing that I feel very strongly about, though, is the, the c consumption of sugar. I think that that's something that really affects um, the psyche insofar as doing, you know, mental and inner work is, um, you know, those, those chemicals and pro processed food and sugar, those things I think hinder and maybe, you know, maybe somehow, uh, yeah, I think I'm just trying to say that the diet is really important and a little bit of stretching or exercising. I don't think you have to go crazy. I don't think you have to become a CrossFitter or start doing things like crazy. I think if you can do some stretches, try to get out and take a walk and try to drink water and, you know, just cut the sugar, cut the soda, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables, try to get organic when you can, you know, don't be so strict that you can't do the inner work because you're so focused on your diet. That's yeah. consuming too much of your energy then just do 
the best that you can consistently so you can start to work on some of the other layers of the self. Right. And and for diet, for me, it was, I love the way that you said that you should try different things because I'm, I'm like you, like what may, your diet may not work for me at all. Like it may, we just, right. it just may not work. And especially when you start adding physical conditions like you have and I have, that right. also starts playing a factor. So everybody's definitely unique, I think, in that. So it's, I, that's why I'm not a big fan of these big diets and these fancy yeah diets we're all different and right. i did it slowly uh, that I, I also want to stress that to people at first i tried to radically change quickly and that just was turned into a disaster because it, i had to do it incrementally and slowly like re yeah. eliminate one thing and then add something and then kind of work at it slowly i think a lot of people go at it they're like i'm vegan and they just you know they go from being a meat eater to a vegan overnight and i'm like this is not gonna work and well <laughs> yeah yeah and being being a healthy vegan is not you it's know, not it's not fries and pizza with no cheese like this. <laughs> it's if you're going to really, really do it, it requires a lot of dedication. And again, I did that in my early 20s. I was vegan and it consumed so much of my time and resources and energy cooking for myself appropriately to make sure I was getting all my, you know, my, my enzymes and my amino acids. And it's like at that time in my life, diet was consuming my body and my my physical health was consuming so much of my time. Mm -hmm. But again, we're talking about inner work. So there has to be a balance of taking care of yourself physically, taking care of yourself emotionally, and then having that energy to start to take care of yourself and start to shift the ways that we're, we're mentally addressing things. It has to be addressed holistically. You have to have this kind of mind, body, spirit thing, all kind of dancing with each other. And again, if you get too focused on one area, too much energy going in one area, that's less energy that you can spend balancing the others. Yeah. So again, I, I'm a real proponent for kind of not going crazy, just Find your balance so you can start to address all these things as best as you possibly can. Great advice. Great. That that's what I do. I I just kind of I'm trying. It's a it's a very um, delicate dance. I think, uh, yeah. and I think and it's like you were even saying with exercise. I think then a lot of people when it goes back to what we were talking about with ego, that becomes your identity. You see people if they're not dealing with their inner work. It's not, I think a lot of people think that people just bury it with drinking or drugs or, you know, or, you know, sex, whatever it could be. But a lot of people yeah. also do it with, I see people that are just hardcore exercise. Yeah, that's all totally. they do. Like that's yeah. it. It's another identity. Yeah. Or yeah. I'm vegan. Yep. My whole life is around calm. Reduce. I think my last, my last thing I'd want to suggest is for me, what's helped me is to get to a place where I'm comfortable without any label whatsoever. That's. That's nothing, tough. Yeah, nothing, that's tough. nothing, yep. no label, just me, yep. not a fixing on who I'm trying to project myself to be in the world. Vegan, CrossFitter, yoga teacher, doctor, lawyer, what, 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 you know, even, even with the natural law, like that's so important, but it's still just a part of your fuller, broader experience. Very true. And that, that's a, that's a tough place to get to just to be you. But I, I'm now you got me thinking about that. Like having no, yeah, like you don't, you don't identify with any one thing. You're just you. Like you're. <laughs> I'm me and I, I, I accept me. So when I, again, there's this fine line of distortion because when I say I'm no identity, I'm not hopping on to one of the current narratives of like, oh, I'm gender fluid right, and right. I don't identify as a man. No, I was born a woman. I'm a woman. I accept and I love the fact that I'm a woman. I, I look and I look and I see this is who I am right? Yep. I accept and I love who I am, what I was given, the flaws I was given. And then any other label that I feel the need to constantly talk about, I go into myself and ask myself why. Like, why am I, why am I just focusing on this one thing right now? Like, why can't I just enjoy the, the broader experience while being myself? Great advice. Yeah, that that's, now you're gonna have me thinking about that, Stephanie, after this. I'll be sitting there going, geez, I gotta think about that some more. That's amazing. But I, I, I just want to give the last couple of minutes, Stephanie, I want to also thank you so much mm. for, for joining me. And I, you're always welcome to come back. I, I definitely want to touch on some more things with you. I've already got a list in my mind of topics I would love to uh, really dive into. Ego, maybe diving into that even more deeply in an, another time when you come on, if you would like to do that, I think that would be amazing. Um, you're always welcome back, Stephanie. I can't thank you enough for your time today. I was really looking forward to this, uh, to this mm -hmm. conversation because I, I learn a lot from these conversations that we have and uh, it gets me really thinking 
about mm-hmm. things. So um, I want to give you the last couple of minutes. So can you let people know where they can find your work? Anything that you want to let people know that you're working on, the floor is yours to to let everyone know where they can find you. Sure. Um, first, I have to say, Rick, thank you so much for being you. It's been really a delight to speak sit and hold space with you and talk about these things and to see that we have these similar views about our conditions and not making it our identity. And I'm just so grateful and privileged to um, have met you. And I'm excited to to be affiliated with you in the community more so proceeding forward. So um, you can find me. My website is stephaniemodavis.com. My healthcare project is awakeninghealthcare.com. I have a YouTube channel called Stephanie uh, Mo Davis, just my name. And I'm, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and all the other places as well if you just look up my name. But my main work is really on my YouTube channel, and I write a lot on my blogs. I even wrote an article about Mark Passio recently on my oh, blog. Oh, so, i got to check um, that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to just trying to share information and, and more so just be myself and let go of any, any reasons as to why I feel like I'm not good enough just as I am. Yeah, I'm going to definitely check all that out. I always keep an eye on your work, too, as you know. And um, and I want to let people know, too, that you were just recently part of a a round table that we did with one Grey Work Warriors. And we were getting the female perspective of what it is to be a man, which uh, Mm -hmm. that should be by the time I post this, that's going to be out. So, guys, please, please check that out. Uh, Stephanie was on the panel along with Lisa, uh, Leslie Powers. Mm -hmm. And you guys brought you ladies brought in some great uh, points of Mm -hmm. view and, and a great discussion. It was an amazing discussion and I learned so much just by listening to you and Leslie and that's a tough question I mean and then now we're going to be tackling what does it mean to be a woman uh these are just I think we have things that people should sit down and think about what is it to be a, a good and then go right to the, what is it to be a good human yeah exactly especially in these times yep. so it's it's you know I it was such a privilege to be on that round table and I I hope uh, that I can be a participant in the next one because I really want the feedback from men. I want to learn how I can be better too in this experience of evolving. And we're at such a unique time in history that defining these things is not so easy because we all have to kind of start back yeah. uh, from square one and just say like, you know, we need to get ourselves straight and start just telling the truth and being vulnerable and doing the work upon ourselves before we can really clearly step into these roles. But yeah. it's so beautiful to see that we have such a big community who's accepted that call. So it's I a agree. Privilege. And it's a, and it's an important, I think these are important questions. And when you can come together in a group and just talk about it and you don't yeah. always have to agree, you can agree to disagree, but yep. it just hear people's points of view. There's so much power in that. And I think that's really lacking in a lot of uh, of the world because I think people are so quick on social media. Like that's another one I'd like to get into with one day too. And I got so many topics, Stephanie, that I want to cover with you because I think social media is, it's mm-hmm. got its high points, but it's so destructive. I've seen mm-hmm. it destroy people in my life. I've seen it destroy their lives. Mm-hmm. Um and so I think that's another great topic, but it's great that we, I think it's lacking just getting together and being totally honest and and, and authentic and just talking yeah. about these important topics and willing to listen to each other and learn. I think that's so powerful. Yeah. Rick, thank you so much for um, allowing me to just be myself. I, I've discovered that it's an important part of the process to, you know, I do have knowledge and I do have a lot of information, but for me... I feel most comfortable, especially talking to you and maybe even people in in this network is just showing showing up and just permitting myself to be and share from that space of vulnerability. So again, thank you so much. I'll, I'd like to have you on on my show too. Awesome. And let's just keep the conversation going. I agree. That'd be awesome. And I and I and my one friend that passed away, he, he had a, a YouTube channel and it was called You Were the Greatest. And I always mm-hmm. want to end with, want to tell my guests, you know, Stephanie, you are the greatest. You are the greatest <laughs> at being you. And mm. nobody can do it better. And my friend used to say that to everybody that he would be in contact with. And he would always say, just remember, you're the greatest at being you. And I want to tell everybody mm. that's listening that nobody can be better at being you than you. And you're mm, perfect the way you are. It's taken me a long time to just be me, Rick. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. So thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, I will keep in contact, definitely. And we will do this again, I promise. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. All right. Take care. Well, there you have it, guys. Wow. I cannot thank Stephanie enough for coming and doing this conversation and this coming on the show. 
once again, uh, as I was saying at the beginning, I did bring her on the radio show at revolution.radio. I will try to find that episode and post it on here for you guys. The audio of it, of course. Check it out, guys. She's got a lot of great stuff to, to say and such a, just a genuine woman. And I love hearing her about her story and her pers- her, her thoughts and pers- uh, perspective on things. I learned so much and I was really looking forward to this conversation today and I'm I will promise I will get her back on again there is so many things I want to cover with her as I was saying I like to dive more into the ego I think that's a really important one we kind of did touch on it this one absolutely but I want to go a little deeper and really look at ego because I think a lot of people are in that state they just totally live in this egoic state and it's who they are and it's you know they truly live that state and don't know who they are inside and I think it's so important that people start to discover who they truly are and so I will definitely have Stephanie back on please uh, check out the links below I'm going to make sure I leave links to all the uh, places that she said so you can check her work out she's doing some great stuff great interviews uh, great discussions it was awesome to have her and Leslie Powers on the round table for the one great work warriors Uh, so check that out guys that should be out by the time this video goes up and so it's a great discussion, and uh, make sure you also check out, because we did one, uh, what is it, to be a, a, a good man. I, I can't remember the exact title, guys. Please, oh my lord, forgive me. But yeah, so um, what does it be to be a, what does it mean to be a man? And so we did uh, part one where we kind of, just the guys were talking about it, and then we brought on uh, Stephanie and Leslie to hear a, a female's perspective on it, and it was so powerful and amazing. So please, check out both of them. Lots of great stuff coming out. And I got a lot of amazing guests lined up for the future. 2023 is going to be an awesome year. I got some changes I want to do. I want to start uh, putting up all the audio for my radio shows because some people, you know, this is they like this platform and they like the other platforms I post on. And uh, so I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start taking any interviews that I've done on Revolution Radio and Bring them over here and just upload the audio for you guys. And that way, if you're, you know, got your headset in or you're working around the house, doing whatever it is, going for a walk, you can just have a listen to it. Because a lot of incredible people I've had on my show and very important topics that we're covering. So I hope you guys uh, will take part and listen to that. Uh, You can find my work at the also at... um, The One Great Work Network, there's also 60 plus now content creators there, so I'll leave a link to there so you can go check it out. There's so much incredible content there and creators that you are definitely going to find somebody that you energetically connect with and you uh, seem to get a lot of uh, knowledge from. So please check that out, guys. Uh, It's incredible. Great stuff going on. I really hope that uh, people start doing the work that Stephanie and I were talking about, really diving into who they are, being honest with themselves and knowing that it's not going to happen overnight. I, as I was saying, I, it's a daily thing. I'm always checking in on myself. I make mistakes along the way. And, but at least I become aware of it as I reflect back on, uh, after these interactions or what I'm in, or even reflecting back of how I interact with myself. And at least I'd be then what, become more aware of it i can address it and so that's really cool and it just work it just takes work guys so thank you so much guys for being here for listening and for for supporting me i can't thank all of you enough i really enjoy this uh bringing people on and having these discussions i got some great guests lined up uh in the near future so you know check back often and It'll be a really great year. I'm really excited. I just don't know what to say. I just really have so much energy going on right now and excitement to um, go move forward and and just keep evolving, evolving my show and just doing different things. So thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a great day, great night, wherever you are. And remember, guys, love yourself, love the people around you, and remember, you are the greatest at being you. Nobody does it better. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Are you interested in the paranormal? Murder mysteries. Cryptocurrency and thought-provoking interviews. 
then check out Crypt Rick's I've Been Thinking on YouTube or every Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Studio A at Revolution Radio. Freedomslips.com Welcome to the Crypt. Ha <laughs> ha.